Thank you, Pastor Darrell. We, we love being a part of this church as well. And uh, it always feels so good to be here. This has been a good year for us. A number of people have asked us this question, and I know some of you would like to know why we're still here. <laughs> we were hoping to be back in Paraguay at the end of July. And, of course, since March, we haven't been able to do our regular home assignment uh, and travel and speak at churches and stuff. So we don't have our funding yet to go back to Paraguay. Um, the borders are not open yet, and there aren't commercial flights, but there are ways of getting back. You just have to jump through a few more, more hoops and take, take special flights. But uh, that hasn't happened yet, so we'd appreciate your prayers that, that God would supply in his own way. We've got to uh, learn new tricks. <laughs> uh, I feel like an old dog sometimes, but um, new ways of of doing home assignment, and, and it's a reminder as well that it's not the tricks, it's the Lord uh, that provides, he's the one that calls, he's the one that sends, and he's the one that's going to get us back there. I've spoken to you folks so many times in the past that I, I forget what stories I've told you, uh, so I'm hoping that you are like me and you forget. <laughs> I first read The Lord of the Rings as a teenager, and I was hooked. I've read it two or three times since then, and I've watched the extended edition of Peter Jackson's interpretation of it multiple times. Of all the amazing personalities that turn up in that story, my favorite are the hobbits. They personify that it's not only big people that make important contributions. You may think, that figures, Andy, since you're basically a hobbit. <laughs> and I don't deny it. <laughs> Apart from being small, hobbits love growing things, and peace and quiet, and good food. And though I've never enjoyed a pipe outside my front door or a pint at the pub with my friends, I can certainly understand the appeal. In general, hobbits like to stay at home, and they aren't anxious to have adventures. The older I get, in fact, the more hobbit-like I become. <laughs> that may surprise you since I'm a missionary, and missionaries are supposed to love adventure and discomfort and dragons, <laughs> but in general, I don't. Don't get me wrong, there are many aspects of missionary life that I love, and I wouldn't trade my calling, but I haven't yet learned to embrace discomfort like the true adventurer. Yet I find that a lot of what Jesus asked me to do require, requires at least a little and sometimes a lot of discomfort. In his kindness and because he's always calling me toward growth and becoming more like his son, he asks me to do things and puts me in places that stretch me and inconvenience me and teach me. In our rural community of Escobar, Paraguay, I often participate in the rites surrounding the death of a neighbor. Because it's not the custom to embalm, the burial activities start immediately. The evening of the same day of the death, the body is laid out at the person's home and the neighbors gather to sit without much conversation or any activities through the night with the family. Sometimes, as close relatives arrive, the wife and daughters will wail loudly, and the female relatives arriving might cry loudly as well. It's emotionally draining. And for me, as an outsider to the culture who didn't grow up among these customs, it's awkward and disturbing, and I'd rather be almost anywhere else. The following day, the burial takes place, usually in the town cemetery of Escobar. There is no ceremony of any kind, no words of comfort, no music, no prayers or scriptures. Before the casket is closed the final time, the female relatives may wail again, crying out to the dead loved one. I could choose not to be a part of this, but in a culture where being a good neighbor is everything, how could I embody the gospel and represent Jesus if I stayed comfortable and stayed home? I suspect I'm not the only person here who exhibits hobbit-like qualities. 
And I'm certainly not saying that these qualities are bad in themselves. But if we hold on to them too hard, they can keep us from Great Commission obedience. Let me see if I can illustrate with another story. Back before I was married, during the first two years that I taught Guarani language to missionaries, my students and I would eat lunch at a little open-air restaurant in the town of Escobar. Doña Perla would prepare a fixed meat menu every day, sometimes milanesa, kind of chicken fried steak, sometimes guiso de arroz, which is rice with chicken or beef and vegetables. Almost always very good. One dish that would occasionally turn up in the rotation is not my favorite Paraguayan food. It's called caldo aba, and it's a soup with all the parts of the cow that we don't usually eat in the Midwest. <laughs> Mostly the different parts of a cow's complex digestive system. My custom, taught by missionary parents, is to eat what's put in front of me and be grateful. So when, on one particular day, Doña Perla set a hot bowl of caldo aba in front of me, I said thank you with a smile and inwardly steeled myself for the act of will that eating it was going to require. I eat the cow intestines first because I like them the least and they're easier to eat when I'm hungriest and also because they are tolerable when they're hot and rubbery and congealed when they're not. <laughs> so I immediately began picking out the rings that look a little like large calamari. As I ate, willing myself to swallow each bite, I was looking eastward down the dusty road that led through town toward the city of Villarrica. A pickup appeared, driving westward, with a bulky, awkward load halfway out of one side of the bed. The truck got closer and I realized there was a huge pig in the back of the truck and it was desperately trying to escape over the side. But since it was tied, it was having a hard time. When the pickup was about 20 yards from me, the pig managed to shift its weight far enough outward that it fell out of the bed. But because it was tied by the neck and the rear leg, it thudded against the side of the truck and hung there, slowly strangling. The driver jerked to a stop, jumped out, and pulling out a knife, cut down the enormous fugitive, which crashed to the ground in a cloud of dust, panting. By this time, half the village of Escobar had gathered. This was the best show we'd seen all week. <laughs> As the pig recovered its breath, probably asking itself if freedom was as delicious as it had imagined, the driver and several community members conferred about how best to get the animal back in the bed of the truck, which I now realized had another equally huge pig in it. They decided that if he drove just a little further, past Doña Perla's restaurant, they could drive the pig up the bank and back the truck up to the edge where they could lower the tailgate for the pig to walk in. They managed to do this and tie it in more securely this time, one assumes, now that they knew that they had a hardened case on their hands. The pickup drove west toward Parawari, and we returned to our various duties, of which mine involved finishing my caldo aba. When I got to the table, I saw, crestfallen, that a yellowish, greasy crust had formed on the top. <laughs> Quickly, Doña Perla, consummate hostess, noticed my plight and offered to heat it up for me. She took my bowl in the back and about a minute later brought it back, piping hot and full to the brim. <laughs> <laughs> I think she may have noticed that I had eaten all the bits of intestines. And misinterpreting this as relish, put extra pieces in my mouth. <laughs> Feeling like I'd slid all the way back to the start on a culinary game of snakes and ladders, I started in again on a brand new assignment. I wonder what your reaction is to that story. People often hear me speak in church and greet me after the service with the words, I could never do what you do. 
I think a lot of believers think about missions and it reminds them of all the ways there are to be uncomfortable. They think of snakes and insects and spiders and heat and humidity and not understanding people and being lost and confused and having to eat strange food and the potential for all sorts of danger and sickness. And their next thought is, nope. <laughs> That's not for me. They dismiss the possibility of being obedient to God's call to missions because of the potential that it has to make them uncomfortable. How many times have I ignored or brushed aside what God was asking me to do because I knew it would be awkward and take me out of myself and a hobbit-like voice deep inside has said, Surely he couldn't be asking you to do that. And I've disobeyed. How many times has my growth been stunted and some person left to be blessed by someone else because I have selfishly clung to my right to be comfortable? One of my favorite books in the Bible is the book of Jonah. Four times in the book we see the word for appoint or provide in reference to Yahweh. In chapter 2, he appoints a big fish as his agent of grace in Jonah's life. In chapter 4, he appoints in quick succession a plant to ease Jonah's discomfort and then a worm to give his discomfort back to him and then a scorching east wind to intensify it. In God's intentions to make Jonah's heart merciful like his own, he blesses the prophet with discomfort. So I share with you the challenge that is an ongoing challenge in my life to embrace discomfort and allow God to pull you beyond yourself, your preferences and your self-centeredness, to make you more and more useful to him in his task of reconciling the world to himself and to perfect in you the image of his son, the one who did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross.